Okay, hello everyone. Um, I will do this talk together with Carsten and we decided to divide it in two sections. In the first one I will provide you with the theoretical background for site exploitation territories and in the second part Carsten will show you our R code. So he's responsible for it, so if you, if you want to fight or discuss something you, you can always ask him. So as you all may know, with the advent of the processual archaeology in the 1960s, the archaeological research interest in economic issues started to grow increasingly. And at that time, scholars criticized the fact that studies on prehistoric economy until then had mainly focused on the analysis of material remains from prehistoric sites while ignoring the relationship between each site and its surrounding landscape. And at the University of Cambridge at that time, a res research group led by Eric Hicks came up with some new ideas and concepts which enabled archaeologists to overcome this way of isolated analysis. And they suggested that in order to get a better understanding of prehistoric sites, we should not only analyze the material remains, but also consider the geographical setting of the site itself. And these ideas, they um, were mainly published in a series of three volumes in a large research project which dealt with the early history of agriculture and the transition from hunting and gathering to farming. And there were lots of discussions in this group about um, the economic strategies of hunters and gatherers and, and early farmers and how they would perceive landscapes in different ways and, and yeah, how they would in interact with this. And the concept of site exploitation territories um, was used as an analytical approach to discuss these um, economic issues. And as you can imagine, um, just go to the next one, sorry. So, the general idea of these site exploitation territories was that, like every river has a certain catchment area defined by topography, each archaeological site has also a catchment area which is defined by economic strategies and the local topography as well. And this leads to the point that each archaeological site has, a, has an individual site exploitation territory, pretty much like every river has a very unique catchment area. And this led to the way of thinking that prehistoric sites are not just isolated phenomena, but they are parts of economic systems and the idea of site exploitation territories was used as some sort of middle range theory in, which can be applied in order to link theory with archaeological data regarding space and landscapes. And they were discussing quite a big number of, of issues when they started to <coughs> um, develop the concept of site exploitation territories and I've just listed the, the main ones here. Um, First and foremost, they try to use this concept to define exploitation territories for each archaeological site they would study. And the exploitation territory is this area which you would use while dealing with your daily subsistence strategies per day. So this is a, ter a territory you don't use over the entire year, but only on a daily basis. And they would also try to use this concept in order to analyze where resources came from, which you can find at each archaeological site, and they would also try to reconstruct the vegetation history based on botanic finds and um, animal bones and stuff from the archaeological sites themselves. And all this leads to the point that you'd in fact try to reconstruct the subsistence strategies at each site, and thus you also try to reconstruct the function of the site, which means, is this a site you can use during the entire year or only for a few weeks because the landscape doesn't allow you to, to live there for an entire year or just allows you to live there for a few months and then you have to move on to another um, site. And they also try to incorporate this thinking with and, and reconstruct larger settlement systems and, and then discuss not only site exploitation territories but also annual territories and so on. 
And some um, archaeologists also use this concept in order to estimate the potential site distribution, so as some sort of pr predictive modeling. But there are only very few papers who try to do this. And as you can see, the main premise here is something which is debatable today, because they said, OK, each archaeological site has an optimal geographic location with respect to its economic function. Today we would say, yeah, maybe there are also other, other issues you can uh, consider when you choose a site, for example, religious re reasons or political ones and stuff like that. So as I mentioned, they discussed subsistence strategies in mobile societies and also in farming societies. And the main idea was, by they, they cited ethno, um, anthropologists and their studies, and they had this idea that mobile societies have larger site exploitation territories than sedentary societies. And these larger societies basically mean that you have a, an area which is like 10 kilometers around your site and you would basically walk around not more than two hours away from your site in order to deal with your daily subsistence for like hunting and gathering and so on. And on the, on the other side that farmers had smaller site exploitation territories because you, you have your farm and then you have your fields and you don't have to walk so far. And they suggested that farming societies have a site exploitation territory of like one hour walking distance away from the site. And the thing is, when you combine walking distances with topography and terrain, you end up with lots of different site exploitation territories. And when you um, study archaeological sites in a flat terrain, like somewhere in northern Germany, for example, you have site exploitation territories that te which tend to be more circular. And when you study archaeological sites in more mountainous regions, then you have these sort of distorted forms of site exploitation territories, and they can be way smaller than five kilometers when you walk one hour in this direction, you just don't get so far, and then the slope is so steep that you don't um, walk any further, and so on. And <coughs> the main question is now, how did they try to calculate or define these site exploitation territories? And basically, what they did was hiking, and they gave some students a map and a, and a clock and say, you walk one hour in this direction and in that direction, and then you make notes how far did you go. And there's lots of problems with this approach because it's not only time consuming, it's extremely expensive. And they had sorts of different problems because the students were unused to walking. They had different field equipments and they stopped at bars and so on. And this is <laughs> actually mentioned in papers like, yeah, our students went drinking and they were also <laughs> problems because they had to cross minefields and they were chased by dogs and angry people. So the, the question is now, how, how can we try to calculate site exploitation territories without walking through minefields and getting drunk along the way? And this is when Carsten, this is what Carsten can show you now. Yeah, thanks Jan. Um, now we would like to come to our code a little bit uh, um, but more theoretical things um, beforehand, before we come to the code. Um, as we changed right now, this was also the point uh, where uh, Jan came to me and also like, like this way, uh, Jan has uh, thought about, I would like to use SET techniques within my PhD study and I do not really know how to, to do that. And then I came into it, into the discussion and we started to think about how can we include these kind of techniques or these kind of theor theoretical thinking in this kind of studies and then we relatively uh, fast started to think about um, it should not only be used useful for one PhD study but also it should be somehow um, developed uh, in that way uh, that it can be used for other kind of studies. So. Um, then we started to think about the algorithm we wanted to use. It should be cost efficient and applicable in general, related to different user experiences, as well as different spatial data sets. Then we relatively fast come um, along um, the point that we wanted to use uh, modern techniques and we wanted to use modern high resolution uh, data sets, in this case, shadow radar topography missions. Uh, as the M data set, but we heard on Tuesday that there are 
Um, other data sets uh, uh, soon in the future will be available at final resolutions, but this is the case where we have thought about in the script, it should be useful for any kind of data sets uh, you have um, in that case. We relatively fast come to the end that we wanted to use open source techniques, data as well as programming stuff. Uh, it should be easy to use and with increasing knowledge in R, um, the possibilities to implement own functions to improve the outcome. It should be well documented that it not only can, use, can be used in one PhD study, maybe in another one also. And it should be have a low number of different methodological software tools and sequence. So that means we do not need uh, three or four different software techniques which each of them produces an output. Uh, which is also an input in another one. So we relatively fast come to R, as I'm familiar with R, it was easy to do. <coughs> um, and in combination with the GIS system, um, we relatively have here a good combination to do the calculation and the visualization, stu uh, visualization stuff um, in a GIS system, with it, which is also open source, but you might know them. Uh, more in detail, we implemented here uh, the Tobler cycling function and uh, cost distance analysis together in one R script. Um, and we want to use a user specific digital elevation model, as I mentioned before, and or a slope gradient grid. You can provide it, but you can also calculate it with the script. This is the workflow. We have a cost factor. This is mainly the slope gradient grid. We have a cost function. This is a total cycling function. Comes together to a cost surface analysis. And then we have the cost distance analysis at the third step here, where an accumulated time master will be generated. And out of the time master, you can easily extract isochrones, uh, which mentioned then a site exploitation territory or more or less an area which you can um, pass through in a certain time scale. Short note on the hiking function. I think some of you might know. Uh, it is a mathematical function published by Tobler in 1993. Uh, and it predicts the human walking speed based on slope, as we have discussed before. Um, it's based on empirical data from IMOF 95, the marching data from soldiers, I think. Here, the men came in. Um, a massive data set uh, where the more or less the function is created out. It is then an exponential function where we um, calculate the walking velocity based on the slope gradient in the exponent. This is more, the, more or less the ideal case of the hiking function. You will have the fastest uh, uh, speed on gently slope about, uh, around 5 degrees or minus 5 degrees in slope. Then afterwards, the second part, the cost distance analysis, more or less mentioned before. Um, each pixel has a cost value calculated by the hiking function, and then the cost will be accumulated with movement away from the starting position. At the end, you will do not have that circular angles like Jan mentioned before. You will have then these more structured angle, uh, oh, that uh, structured um, um, shape of the site exploitation territory where you have the DEM or more or less uh, the possibility to cross a certain landscape and taken into account. You change from an -iso uh, from isotropic way to an anisotropic way in discussing site exploitation territories. Um, so now I would like to come to the code relatively fast. You need certain uh, packages, Pythons, perfect. Um, you need certain packages. Um, in this case, we implemented six of them. Um, these packages dealing with geographical data here with raster data sets, the, the spatial data sets, but that means here, if you want to uh, vector data sets, you need to implement that. Um, if you want to like to uh, calculate something with distances, uh, G distance packages, uh, G, the G distance package is one of uh, the most famous things there, and some plotting stuff um, also needed for further processing. Now we'll come to the script shortly. Um, first of all, you have to provide all these libraries to the script. Uh, in the second part, um, you have to implement the function. You have here some plotting stuff that you can more or less see the ideal case of the total hiking function. 
And um, in this part we have, to our knowledge, it is well documented um, so that you can easily come through. Some settings part this is more or less the main part of the user if he has to set. Where is your data? What's the name of your data? The name of your output data? And this is more or less the interesting part. Some parameters you can set, you can leave it. Uh, it will work out, uh, but you can uh, alter it here at that position. And the most important thing, I think, uh, is the damping factor, which we have included. That means we have included a certain slope, damping factor 16 degrees in this case here, um, where passing through a landscape is more or less uh, difficult. And then uh, you can alter here at that position um, the calculation so that the site exploitation tariff is influenced. I will show it later on. Uh, number of isochrones, how many isochrones you want, two in that case. Uh, interval of isochrones means that you want, you are interested in one hour intervals. Then um, read the DM, okay? Then calculate slope if you do not provide it. Um, um, yeah. Spatial current coordinate, your, your starting point, the spatial coordinate will be translated here in a spatial coordinate. You can easily write it as a text, uh, as a text string over there. Um, there is some parts in the, set in the setting part. And then this is more or less something uh, to deal. You do not need it for SRTN data sets, but if you work with, uh, if you walk with, if you work with um, LIDAR data sets or something, it, it gets more and more interesting. Here you reduce more or less your LIDAR data set um, or your DEN data set to the desired area of interest. Then here, more or less, that's all uh, where the magic appears. Um, you implement the Tobler cycling function and the slope. You implement the damping factor where more or less a factor on the cell is, um, is summed up so that this cell will not be uh, crossed in, in, a, in the next processing things. A geocorrection, that, which means if it passes well in a cardinal or diagonal way, will be uh, set here. And then some statistics afterwards uh, to come up with uh, the general statistics of DM or, or slope in your site exploitation territories. Writing stuff um, to write out more or less the uh, accumulated raster surface as well as the shape file, and then you will get more or less these results. This is something without the damping factor, and you see if you apply a damping factor, the shape is totally different, but it is up to the user if he wants to um, apply these things. <coughs> to conclude, uh, the concept of site exploitation territory links theory with data in that case. Um, the statistical language R, in addition to NEGS software, is well suited to delineate site exploitation territories. To our knowledge, from now on, it's easy to implement and easy to extend with own scientific problems. As we have implemented the damping factor, it can here also be implemented barriers <coughs> in different land use scenarios, which also means that all these kind of borders or um, land use um, classes you have can alter the more or less the, um, the velocity if you pass and uh, if it is um, difficult to pass or more easier to pass along a riverside for example all is open source <coughs> and we think it is all well documented with manuals as well as source related comments so that it can be used in other studies if you are interested you can download it from the CSE 1070 website you will find it under the technical notes section here as technical note three, where you can download the code as well as a, a data set to test it and then alter it and uh, let us know if it works. Many thanks.